Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast Season 1. I'm James Laidler, Australian poet, writer and your host. In today's episode, we'll be putting on our wetsuits and fitting on our clumsy masks before swimming down deep in search of hidden treasure within the dark, watery depths of the poem Diving Into the Wreck by American poet Adrian Rich. Deep below the calm ocean surface of this poem are the half-buried truths of our past. Guided only by Rich's beautiful words and the distorted light from the surface, we will be transformed into scuba divers, swimming amidst the wreckage of myth and legend. There are mysteries to solve and rotting hulls to explore, and upon resurfacing, the bends we will surely experience are bound to unsettle us. But the journey is worth it, because this is a great poem. So let's take a dive in, shall we? May I present to you Diving Into the Wreck by Adrian Rich, read to you by the wonderful Lucy Freeman. Diving into the Wreck by Adrian Rich. First, having read the book of myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber and absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I am having to do this not like Cousteau with his assiduous team aboard the sun-flooded schooner, but here alone. There's a ladder. The ladder is always there, hanging innocently, close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. Otherwise, it is a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. I go down, rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me. The blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down. My flippers cripple me. I crawl like an insect down the ladder, and there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. First the air is blue, and then it is bluer, and then green, and then black. I am blacking out, and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone. To turn my body without force in the deep element. And now, it is easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here. Swaying their crenellated fans between the reefs. And besides, we breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes, but words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevailed. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed, the thing I came for. The wreck, and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself, and not the myth. The drowned face always staring toward the sun, the evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty. The ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. This is the place, and I am here, the mermaid whose dark hair streams black. The merman in his armored body. We circle silently about the wreck. We dive into the hole. I am she. I am he whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes. Whose breasts still bear the stress. Whose silver, copper, vermeil cargo lies obscurely inside barrels. Half wedged and left to rot. We are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course the water-eaten log, the fouled compass. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, 
the one who find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths, in which our names do not appear. So I'd like to start our discussion of this poem giving you a little bit of background about the poet herself. Adrian Rich is considered to be one of the most important American poets of the 20th century and was a passionate advocate for women's rights and equality as well as other political causes. This poem is taken from her acclaimed collection by the same title, winning the National Book Award in 1974. However, she refused to accept this reward individually, deciding to share it with fellow nominees Audre Lorde and Alice Walker. Together, these three female writers accepted the award on behalf of women everywhere who are disenfranchised by patriarchal forces in society. Adrienne Rich also declined the USA National Medal for the Arts in 1997. She took a stand here as well, claiming that the very idea of the arts as she knew it was incompatible with the cynical politics of the American government administration at that time, and that art was meant to speak up to powerful institutions rather than blithely show them allegiance. Her stance on these matters clearly makes Rich a deeply political poet with a strong social conscience. In her career, Adrian Rich grew to be one of America's preeminent public intellectuals. Very influential and popular, Rich's writing traced the story of post-war America in a unique and challenging way. Her earliest work, A Change of World, was awarded the prestigious Yale Younger Poets Award in 1951, while her work in the late 1960s and 70s became increasingly radical in both its free verse form and feminist and political content. Indeed, Rich's poems she wrote throughout the 1970s and 80s serve as central texts in the second wave feminist movement. The voice of the speaker in this poem is very haunting and yet powerful. As such, it's important to talk about who the speaker actually is. However, the speaker in diving into the wreck is intentionally drawn as a mysterious figure whose identity is fluid and shifts like the deep sea currents they are surrounded by. Much of the poem is in first person and this creates a sense of the speaker as a lone scuba diver plunging beneath the depths in order to go beyond the book of myths and explore the wreck. The speaker cuts a solitary figure who is determined to brave the unknown and face up to the fears of doing so. The speaker becomes more and more ambiguously drawn. However, as the underwater adventure unfolds, presumably a woman to begin with, later in the poem the speaker is both mermaid and merman part human and part fish, both female and male. This is then reinforced in the line, I am she, I am he. The poem undermines the diver's identity on purpose and thereby raises important questions about gender. This is done to draw both genders together and to make the divisions between male and female seem less significant and more fluid than perhaps the book of myths has made them out to be. The book of myths here, referring perhaps to the stories perpetuated in society that shape our current conception of what constitutes gender in the first place. In other words, Rich is rejecting the narrow stereotypes about women and men created by those in power that dictate and define the essence of what a man is and what a woman is meant to be as well. Rich here is venturing beyond culturally constructed myths of gender identity in search for the truth. To further undermine the diver's identity, the speaker also moves from using the first person I to the collective we. Here, the use of the collective we towards the end of the poem probably alludes to people of either gender who understand and are sympathetic towards the struggle for female emancipation. 
The speaker also places some of the responsibility of this struggle on the reader themselves, saying you are. Combined, the the shifting focus of the speaker universalises the poem's message and its social critique. In this next section, I'd like to draw the listener's attention towards just a few of the magnificent poetic devices Rich uses to make her poem so captivating and strong. The ones I miss will be up to you to discover, so let's start, however, with Rich's powerful use of illusions. Illusions are sprinkled through diving into the wreck and begin when the speaker contrasts her dive to that of the famous French explorer Jacques Cousteau whose feats of underwater exploration captured the world's imagination throughout the mid to late 20th century. But while Cousteau enjoyed an assiduous and industrious team, which helped him to achieve his feats, the speaker in this poem is all alone and vulnerable. The inference here is that Cousteau's life and his team, presumably made up of men, is confident, well-resourced and privileged. Their schooner is sun-flooded in rich light. In contrast, rather than being confident and professionally prepared, the speaker is alone, anxious and uncertain. Nevertheless, by diving in regardless, the poem's broader thematic concerns about the importance of vulnerability in the act of discovery become apparent to the reader. Following this, the poem mentions the ladder leading into the ocean. The allusion to Jacob's ladder is perhaps being pointed to here, a Christian story about a ladder that stretches from earth to heaven. However, rather than going up to the divine world, in this poem, the ladder descends and leads towards a murky uncertainty. Finally, the poem refers to the mermaid and merman, mythical creatures that are a merging of fish and human. Here the poem could be seen as indirectly hinting at how the merging of differences, including genders, can give birth to a creature better adapted to the world it lives within. In this transformation past gender categories, the speaker cannot be hemmed in by narrow ideas of what it means to be a woman or a man. The illusion here might speak to a certain kind of freedom that the speaker feels around the wreck, away from the rules that structure life above the surface. The second poetic device I want to discuss is enjambment. Enjambment occurs when lines of poetry do not create a pause at the end of the line, but rather flow on to the next line of poetry, forcing the reader's eyes down the page. Enjambment is a consistent feature of diving into the wreck, which is composed mostly of short lines that spill down the page quickly and fluidly, perhaps like a diver cutting through the water. Indeed, the poem seems to unfold in a kind of vertical dive down the page. Clearly, the enjambment makes the poem so much more dive-like, as though each line signals a further stage in the descent into the ocean. The fifth stanza is completely enjambed. And now, it is easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenulated fans between the reefs. And besides, you breathe differently down here. It's also worth discussing the poem's few moments of end stops, since they stand out so sharply against the frequent enjambment. For example, listen to these less frequent end stop lines. There is a ladder. I go down. I came to explore the wreck. This is the place. And so on. These lines stabilise key points in the poem, preventing the reader being swept out too far by the hypnotising currents of the language on display. The final poetic device I want to discuss here is the use of the extended metaphor. A metaphor being when one thing is described in terms of being something else. From the words where the speaker says, having read the book of myths, it's obvious that this poem is about something other than a deep sea diving adventure. With this poem sharing the same name from the collection it comes from, a collection concerned with exploring issues of sex, gender and women's rights, this metaphoric reality becomes more obvious. 
Yet what the exact nature of this metaphor is, is up for interpretation. On level one, the wreck could be a metaphor for human history itself. Rather than relying on the highly curated book of myths, written by powerful interests which dictate what is the correct historical narrative on the surface of reality, Rich dives for the deeper and richer understanding about the past as seen from below. In this idea, diving into the past helps to better understand the present and to separate myths from lived realities. More specifically, at the second level of analysis, the wreck could represent the treatment of women throughout human history and the oppression they have suffered. Perhaps the speaker is seeking to reclaim that which has been hidden and suppressed about women over the centuries. At the third level, the wreck may represent our subconscious, which the speaker feels must be explored in order to gain a better understanding of themselves. And finally, at the fourth level, the wreck might refer to some personal trauma that the speaker needs to face in order to move forward in life. Regardless of the level, however, the point here is that Rich sees value in the stories of the past as seen from below, and this connects her poem very deeply with the movement of critical theory in academic circles that has been trying for quite some time to elevate the voices of marginalised people in our world. So I want to talk here about one of the leading themes in the poem. Let's call it the narratives that shape our reality. Concerned with storytelling, diving into the wreck implicitly asks who is in control of the narratives we tell and why. Because the stories we tell often shape and define the society in which we live, Rich uses her poem to argue that these stories need to be deeply investigated rather than taken at face value. In particular, we need to investigate the broad cultural myths defining male and female behaviour, as well as those personal and familial myths that define individuals. The stories people insist made them who they are, but which are so often curated half-truths that hide reality. Diving into the wreck also makes the point that there are many stories worth telling which are currently invisible to most people. Overall, it could be argued that the poem is insisting that we shouldn't just consume the usual narratives of the day, but we should strive to make more marginal voices heard. The speaker prepares for the dive by reading the book of myths, loading the camera and sharpening the knife. A camera is a recording device. Suggesting the speaker wants to document the journey undertaken in order to tell a new story and legitimise it with evidence. While a knife points to the fact that the pursuit of truth can be fraught with danger, particularly for women who set out to challenge patriarchal individuals and institutions, particularly from those forces protecting the wreck as it stands. The Book of Myths, meanwhile, seems to be some sort of book filled with the tales about the wreck. When the speaker later says the words are purposes and maps, This suggests that the stories can provide a sort of guidance and impetus to see something, but it's not the same as actually seeing the thing itself. What's more, the book leaves a lot of people out of its stories. The dive allows the speaker to experience the wreck firsthand, to go beyond the book of myths, to the truth of things. The speaker draws a clear distinction between the story of the wreck and the thing itself. Stories are such an important part of human existence, but they don't always represent reality. They are instead a way of describing, considering, and interacting with that reality. The final theme I want to talk about is that of female subjugation and powerlessness. The poem can be read as an extended metaphor about female subjugation and powerlessness. 
especially in the pages of recorded history. Rich seems to focus on the need for women to interrogate and explore the wreck of the past and to see the damage that was done to them and ultimately to discover and write a new narrative about their lives and shared realities. The book of myths that describes the wreck is manifestly insufficient. By applying feminist critical theory, a book of myths could be interpreted as a relic of our male-dominated world, and this explains why the speaker is deeply suspicious about it. This prompts the speaker to crack the surface of the water and travel down towards another version of female reality that lies under the surface. The speaker is alone and the ocean is deep, underscoring the daunting nature of such an undertaking, as well as just how deeply ingrained stereotypical ideas about gender are, how far they wind back into the past, and thus how deep the speaker must dive in order to go beyond them. In venturing to the wreck, the speaker experiences its damage, but also its threadbare beauty, the ribs of the disaster, as well as the treasures contained within. Treasures laid bare by the disaster that are too often left to rot out of view. It is worth noting here, too, that during the poem, the figurehead of the boat is a point of focus. A figurehead is a wooden decoration placed on the bow, the front of the ship, that acts as a kind of guardian angel for the sailors on their journey. More often than not, these figureheads are female. If that's what's being referred to in the poem, then the figurehead is no longer a symbol of hope and prosperity and safety. Rather, it instills before us the tragic idea of a forever drowning woman staring longingly up towards the sun far above the surface of the water. And of course, in a feminist reading, perhaps this drowned face represents the pain suffered by women throughout history. In the poem, the speaker also claims to be gender nondescript, both mermaid and merman. This alludes to the idea that the speaker should not be constrained by narrow ideas of femininity or masculinity, making a case for the inclusion of queer people too, who have also been ignored by the patriarchal march of history. Indeed, in the poem's final line, the speaker reveals that our names do not appear in the book of myths at all. The poem thus becomes a powerful statement on the extinguishment of marginal voices, and importantly, a call for those stories that don't normally get heard to be amplified, understood, and valued. So it's time to wrap up this week's episode and say goodbye. Of course, if you would like to access further resources on poetry, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. We would also really appreciate it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel or podcast. I really hope you got as much out of this poem as I did. We'll finish by listening one more time to the poem. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Diving into the Wreck by Adrian Rich. First, having read the Book of Myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber and absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I am having to do this not like Cousteau with his assiduous team aboard the sun flooded schooner, but here alone. There's a ladder. The ladder is always there, hanging innocently, close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. Otherwise, it is a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. I go down, rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me. The blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down. My flippers cripple me. I crawl like an insect down the ladder and there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. First the air is blue and then it is bluer and then green and then black. I am blacking out and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. I have to learn alone to turn my body without force in the deep element. And now, it is easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here. 
swaying their crenellated fans between the leaves. And besides, we breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes, the words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevailed. I stroked the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed, the thing I came for. The wreck, and not the story of the wreck, the thing itself, and not the myth, the drowned face always staring toward the sun, the evidence of damage worn by salt and sway into this threadbare beauty. The ribs of the disaster curving their assertion among the tentative altars. This is the place, and I am here, the mermaid whose dark hair streams black, the merman in his armored body. We circle silently about the wreck, we dive into the hole. I am she, I am he, whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes, whose breasts still bear the stress, whose silver, copper, for May cargo lies obscurely inside barrels half-wedged and left to rot. We are the half-destroyed instruments that once held to a course, the water-eaten log, the fouled compass. We are, I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths, in which our names do not appear. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.